Hello, Jeff Zwerink, and welcome again to the Science Faith Connection, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas and see how they relate to the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Fuzz Rana, now president and CEO of Reasons to Believe, and we're going to discuss what science has to say about the origin of humanity. Fuzz, good to have you here today. Jeff, thanks. So, uh, you know, you've written, uh, again, this is one of those topics I know you've researched extensively. I think you first published Who Was Adam uh, back in 2005, Five. 2006, somewhere in there. I know you had an update to it, I think, in 2015. Extensive update to it. Uh, again, I, take a few minutes here and just walk us through what yeah. is RTB's model on the origin of humanity? Yeah, well, we would adopt what I would call the traditional biblical perspective on human origins, which is that Adam and Eve were the very first human beings, that they were created through God's direct personal involvement, uh, and that uh, they are the sole progenitors of all humanity. All human beings come from Adam and Eve, and that they were uniquely made in God's image to, to stand apart from all other creatures. And so, you know, our creation model would, uh, in effect, predict that uh, when we look at the the origin of humanity, we would see evidence for a, 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 an origin of humanity at or near where the biblical text describes the Garden of Eden, that we would expect there to be evidence that humanity indeed did come from two individuals, and that there's something exceptional or unique about human beings compared to all other creatures. You know, our model rejects uh, our human evolution as mm -hmm. an explanation for the origin of humanity, Again, humanity would be uh, directly created by God, uh, but yet we acknowledge the existence of the hominins, of course, mm -hmm. and would say that these were just simply creatures that were created by God, that had some intelligence, emotional capacity, but they lacked the image of God. Uh, we would also say that the, the shared biological features we see between humans and other creatures, like the great apes, reflects common design as opposed to common descent. So the evidence that people would cite in favor of human evolution, we would argue, could be explained in a creation model context. So what what would you put out there? You know, somebody said, okay, you know, you're kind of taking a position that's largely against mainstream science. You know, what what are kind of two or three key pieces of evidence that you would say, oh no, this is actually the right way to look at things? Yeah, well, I mean, for example, the the, the primary evidence that people will give for human evolution is, again, the shared biological features that we see between humans and other creatures. And so one example would be looking at the, the structure of the human chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And chromosomes are these pieces of DNA, large pieces of DNA that are complexed to proteins, like, hit, like, like the histone proteins. So the human genome consists of 3.2 billion genetic letters, but the, that it's not one large piece of DNA that DNA is broken up into 22 what are called autosomes and then one sex chromosome. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and each human being has uh, two sets of chromosomes, one coming from the mother, one coming from the father. So we have a, 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 a pair of 23 chromosomes or a total of 46 chromosomes. Right. If you look at uh, chimpanzees, they have 48 chromosomes. And what's interesting is chimpanzee chromosome 2A and 2B looks a whole lot like human chromosome 2, that you can actually lay, align those two chimp chromosomes uh, it, against the human chromosome 2, and the batting, banding pattern looks the same. There are, are internal telomeres in human chromosome 2, which are uh, characteristic sequences of DNA that are on the ends, the tip ends mm -hmm. of chromosomes, and there are two centromeres. These are attachment points for uh, the mitotic uh, spindle that takes place during cell division. And so, so, so this looks like what's happened in the apes is you've got these two chromosomes that have fused together and become our human chromosome too. Exactly, exactly. And so the evolutionary argument it would be that this happened uh, bef uh, sometime after humans and chimps had their separate evolutionary lineages diverge, mm -hmm. uh, it happened at some point in the in the human, you know, evolutionary lineage. Now, uh, I've written uh, in the past that 
I, I'm uncomfortable with this scenario because it essentially relies on a sequence of highly improbable events. Telomere-telomere fusion is very unusual in chromosomes because the point of telomeres is to prevent fusion from taking place. And if you break off the tip end of a chromosome and remove the telomere, the chromosome loses stability because part of the role of the telomere is to actually stabilize the chromosome. So, so if I get what you're going at here, it's not, you're not saying, okay, this doesn't look like a fusion event, but if you ask the question, what needs to go on for the fusion event, the things that show up just don't make sense in there. Right. It, it's a highly, highly improbable sequence of events, okay. you know, because even if you did have chromosome fusion, that usually leads to a disease state because you have differing numbers of chromosomes. It, it makes, it, it renders the organism usually infertile. Mm -hmm. And so it, you just wouldn't expect to see that kind of chromosomal fusion. Well, there was a study done a, f a couple of years ago now by independently by two separate research groups that were looking at uh, chromosome fusion in yeast. And they were trying to see if they could take in Brugger's yeast, there are 16 chromosomes, and fusion, fuse them into a single massive chromosome. Well, this was a very complex problem to solve because, first of all, they had to very carefully choose which chromosomes they would fuse together mm -hmm. uh, in order to ensure that when the fusion took place that there was a centromere near the center of the chromosome. They had to actually go in and, and deliberately deactivate one of the centromeres because if they didn't, the, the yeast cell wouldn't divide. Mm -hmm. They had to very carefully splice away the telomere DNA mm -hmm. in order to get sticky ends that would lead to fusion. And then they had to do some tricks to actually get that fusion to take place. And then the resulting yeast cells, when they, they had essentially a single chromosome, they lost reproductive fitness. They weren't as robust as a wild type yeast cell and they oftentimes would, would lack uh, fecundity. They, the, their reproductive capacity was lost. Okay. And, and so what, they, what was being demonstrated experimentally is how difficult this fusion is, how precise it has to be, uh, and that the, the, the concerns that we raised were actually experimentally demonstrated to be valid uh, in the yeast about you know, loss of health, loss mm -hmm. of, of reproductive capacity. But what, what's intriguing to me is that if they didn't deactivate one of the centromeres, the, the, there's no way that the yeast cell was able to reproduce. Well, if in human chromosome two, there are two centromeres, one is activated and one it looks like it's undergone significant mutation. But when you look at the rate of mutation, it would take so long for that centromere to de deactivate that it's highly unlikely that if there was a fusion event that resulted, that it, that you would be able to get mm -hmm. effective reproduction. So, in other words, what that study shows is that it's really unlikely that chromosomal fusion is a natural event. That if it does happen, it looks like it has to be engineered by an intelligent agent. And so, in our model, we would say that fused chromosome really reflects the deliberate action of a creator. Uh, not certain why that creator would, would cause those two chromosomes to fuse, but apparently that was part of making human beings uh, who we are as human beings. You know, th this is fascinating uh, just for a number of reasons, but one, it's like, you know, there's these things that look like they're, oh, they support this model, support something that's against Christianity, and then as we learn more, it's like, oh no, that actually seems to be pretty compelling evidence for the truth of Christianity. And it kind of goes to your point. It's uh, that uh, you know we expect to see divine intervention in what's going on. Uh, what what else do you expect? I mean, if you were to make a prediction here in the last thirty seconds, what else would you expect we would find as we continue to understand how humanity works? Yeah, I, I think we would continue to see more and more evidence that the, that our genome, or the sum total of our DNA. Uh, is is elegantly designed that it's you know reflects deliberate action on the part of an intelligent agent and you know thanks to things like the encode project the, the trend line is going in that direction thanks Fuzz. really appreciate your comments
the origin of humanity is just a fascinating question and it really comes to the fore when we look at the human genome. It really does seem to have these hallmark signatures of being very well engineered, not even just in how it works as a system, but also in how the chromosomes are put together. You know, I'd encourage you to go to reasons.org. Fuzz has written a great article about this yeast study. It's called Yeast Gene Editing Study Raises Questions About the Evolutionary Origin of Human Chromosome 2. Gives you great insight into what all's going on and how it actually points to the hand of God being at work in manufacturing humans. Go check the article out. Better equip yourself to go out and share the gospel.